what I'd like to start with is to ask you if you would share um, a personal experience that you have had in seeking, receiving, and following divine guidance. And, you, and when you talk, you could look at me. You don't have to look at the camera. Right. There are so many. It's hard to, hard to select. Perhaps an earlier one uh, was the most dramatic for me in that um, I've been invited to speak in Israel. I've always wanted to go to Israel, see the roots of my grandparents. And about five days before going there, in my morning meditation, the guidance was, uh, after I'm through my lecture, go immediately to Egypt. I didn't know anyone in Egypt. It seemed like a crazy thing to do. And so I kind of ignored it. Because I really wanted to see the historical places. And it kept gnawing and gnawing and gnawing at me. So finally, I, I uh, indeed uh, canceled my trip. In those days, you couldn't go from Israel to Egypt. You had to go to Greece. I remember talking with Bill Fetford, who, with Helen Shuckman, uh, brought the Course of Miracles into being. And I said, Bill, this sounds like such a crazy thing for me to do. My, my ego mind just going crazy around this. And I was just trying to think, you know, there, I don't even know anybody in, in Egypt. There was someone who would be, who would be Mrs. Sadat, because they've just established this new hospital that she had a lot to do with, and I would be interested in that. So I got to. Greece and on the plane going from Greece to Egypt, there was a magazine, airline magazine, had a little article about a Dr. Shabander who was head of the Cancer Institute in Egypt. And well, maybe this is a voice from God or something. Maybe I should call him because we have something in common. And uh, through the concierge, I was able to find this person on Friday and got a hold of him. And he said, Well, I'm sorry, but uh, today is. Uh, like Sunday in your country, and I'm just on my way to go to a party, and it's not possible for me to, to see you. Now this long silence said, well, you're only about 10 minutes away. If you've got a taxi right now, I, I could see you for 10 minutes. So I took this taxi, and nothing better to do. And uh, it was one of those experiences where you felt immediately you've known each other for all of your life. and. Uh, he invited me to come with he and his wife. And they were going outside of uh, Cairo to a party where most of Sadat's cabinet was going to be. He wasn't going to be there, but most of his cabinet was. And uh, the Minister of Health happened to be there and became interested in our work in attitudinal healing and invited me on Monday to come to his office. And I came to his office and Spent about an hour and a half with him, but just, well, just before the last half hour began, he excused himself and said, I have to make a phone call. And he came back and said, I've just arranged for you to have a, a, an appointment with Madame Sadat. And all of a sudden, I sort of got goose pimples remembering that little flippant statement I made to, to Bill Thetford. And, and he said, uh, you have 20 minutes, but I think she'd be interested in some of the things that you and your people are doing. I met with her in uh, rather than 20 minutes. It lasted for two and a half hours. It was just an amazing experience. And when I returned home, Alan, it wasn't that so much that I met this very amazing person, Madame Sadat, but that I didn't listen to my rational voice. I had the courage to, to listen to that inner voice, even though it didn't make logical sense. And it gave me a sense of energy, a, a validation in a sense, to, to really listen mm. and not get caught in the world's belief system. A couple of years later, I was helping put on a conference in the auditorium in San Jose on uh, transformation, uh, and uh, 
It's around a project we had called Children as Teachers of Peace that I started. We would take children to Russia during the Cold War and to China and to Central America. And the guidance was to call Madame Sadat and invite her to come. And again, I started this big argument. She sees thousands of people. She wouldn't even remember who I was. And I kept fighting it and finally I said, okay. I wrote kind of a brief letter and not ever really expecting to hear from her. And I think about three weeks later, I was in New York City and my secretary called me and said, Madam Sadat's secretary is trying to reach you. I called her and uh, she accepted the invitation. And she came with her daughter and it was actually the first time that she had left Egypt since the death of her husband. She had, by custom there, you don't do any traveling for a whole year. And um, in meeting the children at our center and getting involved in some of the things that we were doing, it tended to be an uplifting experience for her for the first time uh, since that time. Um, she invited me to Egypt and, and uh, we began to lecture together in different places in Sweden and Finland and Holland and elsewhere and um, became uh, close friends. Uh, after Di and I married, uh, she invited us back to, to Egypt and we spent some interesting time with her and with some people that were going through some difficult times that Di and I could be a census too. Uh, she came to the hospital here with me and different work in our, as we on our visits with the Attitude of Healing and uh, continues to remain a friend. Uh, and uh, that wouldn't have happened if I said, well, this is crazy, and I went to, to visit the historical land place that I, that I wanted. So I would say that uh, that was very early in my experience as, on a spiritual pathway. And I was. I started my spiritual journey consciously in 1975. And um, so that was a, and of course there are many, many different examples like that. For example, this house that we, that you find yourself in. When I got divorced in 1973, after a 20 year marriage, it was a very difficult divorce, painful divorce. I was not on any spiritual journey at the time and I was full of guilt and full of anger. And a friend of mine was just leaving for Spain and had this wonderful apartment right on the waterfront. So I lived there for 17 years. And uh, when I wasn't there, uh, people with cancer would come there. And uh, I remember one, one time I came back from a trip and got up in the morning and there were a bunch of nuns there. And I didn't even, I forgot that, that, that they were coming there that, 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 that day. Well. The building got sold and my rent was raised 2,000%. Yeah, obviously, they didn't want me there anymore. And I realized as I looked one day for rentals how much the rent has risen here and I had no idea. And uh, Diane and I were just finishing a book, Love is the Answer. It was Sunday, 1 p.m. And I just had that inner feeling that hey, we had to stop what we're doing right now and take a walk. And somehow we're going to meet someone who's going to help us find a place. I just had that strong feeling. I know it doesn't sound logical. And Diane was very respectful of my guidance and immediately said, let's do it. Ten minutes later, I met a woman I hadn't seen in ten years. She just moved down the street in a beautiful house and brought us in the house and shared where she was. And that was asking us questions. We said, well, we're in the process of looking for a place. Oh, I know the perfect place for you, this place in Kyle Cove. So she brought us here. And and uh, we met the landlord who we know she knew. He said, I'm sorry, the place was just rented yesterday. It's not available. So as we're walking away, Diane says, Jerry, I see in my heart and my vision that we're going to live here. So I take my spiritual head off and I put my psychiatric head on. I said, Diane, you're into denial here. You know, if someone says, no, we have to kind of deal with it. We don't want to fight that. He says, no, I really feel that we're going to live here. Is it all right if we don't look for a place for a couple of weeks? And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that. 
Four days later, we have a phone call from the landlord saying that the person that was going to rent it has not has chosen not to, would we still be interested in? Turned out that that person lived in a house pretty next, maybe two houses away from me where I was living in the water in Tiburon. And Diane had a uh, theory that the Good Wish Fairy on a foggy night put the gold dust on the wrong house and fog disappeared, came back, put it in our house. So uh, we've been here now 10 years. And this uh, very uh, spiritual is my guidance was to find a place where uh, that would be peaceful, uh, that would be in nature, where you could kind of detach yourself from the world and be close to God. And uh, this turned out to be the absolutely uh, beyond my imagination, uh, perfect place for that. Could you talk a little about how you seek guidance, the process, the form you use? Well, it's continued to remind myself that um, my ego mind doesn't really know what's best for me or anybody else. So I do my best every day to come to God with empty hands. Um, I'm an amateur photographer, and for many years, the only thing I took pictures of with people's hands. And I had them all over my house to remind me to come to God with empty hands, not hold on to anything in the past and say that I really don't know what, what's best. Uh, when I started my spiritual journey in 1975, the clear message was that my life was going to be different. Although I was an atheist at the time, it said that God and I, my will and God's will would be one, and that my life would be one of service. Well, I had thought I'd been one of service, but we really hadn't been. I was, I was very interested in a lot of material stuff in the world at that point. So it really means for me, um, starting the day, we get up at 4.30 by choice. Um, we do a prayer. Comes from A Course in Miracles. I'm not a body, I am free, for I'm still as God created me. I want the peace of God. The peace of God is everything that I want, the aim of all my living here, the end I seek, my purpose, my function, my life, while I abide where I'm not at home. Well, for us, that puts the rudder in the, in the sailboat in a direction rather than going around in a circle. And, and, and um, we have a little ritual in bed where we feel our body dematerialize into light and that we feel our light extending to our immediate family and our extended family and the people who are suffering from lack of love. And um, we have that experience before we even get out of bed. Um, and we do yoga and then we do some meditation here. Um, and uh, it's always asking for guidance, what it is I should think, say, and do, uh, rather than doing, trying to do what I think my ego wants to do. And it's not that I and Diane are always there. We're not. We're challenged all the time. But I would say more and more <laughs> we're there as time, as, time, as time moves on, and it feels that uh, so many miracles continue to happen in our lives that uh, would not be able to happen if they chose to do it in a different different way. And um, how do you receive this guidance in terms of, you know, do you hear a voice? Hear what? How's it come to you? Um, during my alcohol days, I thought I heard a voice coming from outside saying to me that you're in a new phase of healing and that it's no longer necessary for you to drink. It didn't seem like an inner voice. It felt like, you know, I was going to see purple elephants on the, on the wall any moment. And uh, it scared the hell out of me. And then 
woke up and forgot the dream and uh, what happened and went to work and came home back and did my usual thing. I come to the kitchen and get my scotch bottle and so I had my hand in the scotch bottle and I heard that same voice. And uh, I didn't have any scotch and uh, I lost about 60 pounds in like two months, not realizing I'd gotten that heavy. Uh, but for the most part, that voice that I hear, I would say is similar to like an inner dictation. Uh, some people might call it intuition. Sometimes it's a green light. Sometimes it's just an inner sense of knowing. It's Christmas time now that you're doing this, and uh, uh, I usually call a number of people that I feel God wants me to call. But this one person was someone I really didn't know that well. <laughs> He had been at the center for a little bit and then moved to Hawaii. And I called him. And in the afternoon, about four, and his wife had left him about two weeks previous. And I was the only person that called him that day. And it really brought tears to my eye, you know, that somehow, out of nowhere, this this voice came to, to call this person, and then I did it. So I was really very grateful, you know, that I, I listened, you know. I think one thing is listening, but the other thing is following direction. I realized I'm not in control to, to want to be fo to, to follow. Mm. Can you talk a little about that process, like discerning which voice is talking to you? Well, sometimes I'll ask a question and I'll get an answer. I figure it must be no, <laughs> that my ego is involved in, in that. So it's not an I don't know, it's a no. So I look at I don't know as, as, as no's and feel like I don't have to make a decision about that today. I, I already made it, you know, in that way. And sometimes it is an ego decision that I'm not ready to to listen you know, at that, that point. Are there certain so, qualities of the inner voice that tells you it's from God or it's divine? Well, to me, it's a very gentle quality and it's also one that leaves me feeling peaceful rather than tense <laughs> Um, sometimes it's sort of like taking me by the neck. We were, two years ago, uh, Diane and I were invited to go to Bosnia, a special conference for religious and spiritual leaders who had experienced tremendous atrocities from the other side. And we're talking about Serbs and Muslims and Croatians and Catholics. And it was a conference on reconciliation and forgiveness. And um, these people felt that uh, politicians would never resolve what's going on there. Things were so awful that maybe, maybe they could do something about it. But as they gathered for the first of the three-day conference, they became pretty fearful. And they, all of a sudden, they had to form what forgiveness looked like. If the other person apologizes first, maybe I will. So there's kind of standoff around this aspect. And Diane's my guidance was just to kind of continue to bless everyone with love, not get caught in the outcome, whether they're going to change or not, but just to keep that flow going of unconditional love. And somehow we were able to create a, an atmosphere of unconditional love where they could really begin to hear the other person without interrupting and hear the other person's story. And hear the other person's pain. And they're able to do that on both sides. I remember there was a Serbian priest. How old are you? 42. 42, he's about your age. Looked like you, as a matter of fact. 
And uh, he mentioned when he was 16, uh, he was coming home and his whole house was on fire. Mother, father, and two brothers burned alive. But somehow he knew at that age that if he hadn't forgiven on the spot, that he'd join them and continue the recycling the anger and the murder. He'd kill someone and he'd be killed. Yeah. And he went to the priesthood. Well, coming back on the plane, this was such a powerful experience. I was in the middle of another book, writing a book called Shortcuts to God. Sort of a, it's a sequel to Love is Letting Go of Fear after 20 years. I was pretty much involved in that book. And it was like, God, take me to stop writing that book and write a book on forgiveness. So I did what I was supposed to do, and I wrote this book on uh, forgiveness, the greatest healer of all, which came out, what, in September of 1999. And then after that, I returned back and just finished Shortcuts to God, which will come out in September. But it wasn't a rational thing, because my rational mind is, well, you're in the middle of this, you've got to finish this, and then you do that. Uh, but it was almost like God taking my hand, you know, and then saying, you know, this is what you're supposed to do right now, and I knew that's what I was supposed to do. I guess it's another way of saying it is learning not to doubt. Kind of getting that uh, doubting Thomas to dissolve, you know. How do you do that? By not getting involved in the outcome, by getting involved in, in, in just wanting to be a vehicle of um, really wanting to serve and not feeling that I need anything at this point, that whatever I need will be provided for. And to uh, not ask the wrong question about the future and things of that sort. Hmm. For example, I, I had some serious problems with my, I have glaucoma. My mother was blind from glaucoma. Medically, it's a degenerative disease that leads to blindness. My left eye is functionally blind. In my right eye began to get in trouble and I had an operation. And uh, I had some problems in the beginning listening to God's voice. And my ego voice came up and said, well, what happens if uh, the operation is not a success or that uh, you end up being blind? And finally, I was able to turn that around and stop asking that question. So you keep in the present, see what you can do to be helpful all, every part of the way in your journey. So, uh, in the hospital, the nurse was taking my pulse and blood pressure and said, my Dr. Jan Polska, you're, you seem so calm and your pulse is so low and your blood pressure, what, is there something drug you're taking? I said, no, I, I, I just have a relationship with God that helps me very much. So, you know, I'm having a lot of problems with God today, could you help me? And so I was keeping the consciousness of helping her. And of course, I wasn't asking questions about the future. Then the anesthesiologist came in and my guidance was to get his attention by saying to him that I understand with HMOs that a lot of anesthesiologists are not making the same kind of money they're making before. I, Do you have some feelings about that? All of a sudden all this anger came out and I could really listen and be there for him. Then they wheeled me into surgery. And my brother is a very famous ophthalmologist, mainly with children, Mr. Business. But I knew this. My I doctor knew that my brother, in one sense, would be looking over his shoulder. And so I decided to bring that out in the open. I said, you know, Dr. Lee, you, you and I both know that my brother's probably looking over your shoulder. <laughs> and if you feel that way, there'd be some little tension, a little, little anxiety about it. And I'd just like to suggest that, forget my name is Jan Polsky, treat me as Jerry Smith. <laughs> And, you know, maybe acknowledge that you might let, and then let, let go of that, and then we can both go on and say, you know, I'm really glad you mentioned that, Jerry, because you know, I was concerned about that. Just, t just hearing you talk about it allowed me to get rid of it. So allow me just to kind of stay in the present uh, all the time. I had another operation in my eye that a year later that ended up in the, 
a very severe infection of the inner ball of my eye, very painful, and usually 99% causes permanent blindness. And uh, actually, I was blind for about three weeks. And after the first week, I asked my wife to go back to work. That I have people come in and help me read my mail and take me where I need to go. But I just think I need to get back to feeling a normal kind of wife, not being just dependent. Well, what happened, Alan, was um, a lot of the people. I had worked with uh, came back to help me. Uh, Sally Kin is a, I guess she's in her 40s now, but teenager when I saw her, she had serious cancer. And, and uh, she took off work. On her birthday. Come help me. Saying that uh, this is her gift to me. Because she didn't think she'd be here if she hadn't come to the Center of Actual Healing. And I saw many other people in the same way. A mother whose uh, son had died of the age that I had been helpful to him. And uh, the lesson for me that I felt God was giving me was the, the first book I'd ever written was To Give Us to Receive a Mini Course for Healing Relationships. And I think I really understood what giving was, but I really didn't understand what receiving was. Mm. There's that part of my ego that wanted to be independent and strong. And here I was learning to accept with grace people giving to me. I come from a family that my Father had a mother had a small date store, and, and uh, they're very giving people. You know, at Christmas time, boy, they'd give to the ice man to the little gift there and little gift there. But they weren't very good accepting gifts. And uh, I don't think that I ever was very good at receiving in that kind of way. I think I had some old hang-ups about guilt or not being worthy of. And uh, so I, I learned. Uh, a new lesson in receiving, that giving is receiving, and it was like God had, had these people come back into my life as angels, making more alive than any time ever before that to give is to receive, and they were all evil teachers and students uh, to each other, and that no matter what's happening to you, it can be turned around into a positive lesson God would have us learn. So I began to uh, see uh, that the most important thing for me was to see people in the light, see people with Christ vision. Uh, there's one liner I like in the Course of Miracles that uh, Today I choose to use Christ's vision to look upon all things and judge them not, but I would give them the miracle of love instead. So a lot of miracles keep happening. Uh, you and I talked a little bit here Jewish about what your experience with Jesus. Well, my experience with Jesus as a Jew was he never mentioned that word or the negative word. So I came involved in the Course of Miracles and a lot of the Christian terminology was like pornography a little bit. And I remember one day that um, I found that uh, in my meditation that uh, my relationship with Jesus was very abstract. I wanted to have a real relationship. I remember asking for that help. And I really believe when you ask God for help, you get it. I remember saying that to Diane. And um, it was November, and December 18th. I get a phone call from France, Switzerland actually. It's a bad connection, but some woman wanted to give me a gift. And I said, well, you know, I wasn't home for last Christmas, and I'm going to have to be here this Christmas, and I can't really come now. And if you talk to me again December 26th, if you want to be interested. I thought she was a little drunk. I didn't know who she was. 
Seven twenty-six. I get the call from the same person. It's clear from Clemency. She happened to be the wife of my French publisher, saying there's this woman who was one of the wealthiest people in, in Finland who come to England, not to Switzerland, and was a very cantankerous woman, didn't like people. Came across my book, Love Is Letting Go of Fear. It came like a Bible to her. It changed her life. Changed her name to Happy. Uh, gave all her money away. She had only one thing left, and that was a 13th century painting of Jesus Christ that had been in her family for centuries. And she'd gone up in the mountains to meditate what she should do with this painting and came back and said, I'm supposed to give it to Jan Polsky, author of Love Is Letting Go of Fear. The people around her said, look, you never even met this person. He's some flaky Jewish psychiatrist in California, you know. I don't think you really want to give it to him. I said, yes, I want to give it to him. So, um, Diane and I, they paid, they paid for two tickets. We went, to Swit we went to Switzerland and met this woman who was in great health and was an amazing lady. Wonderful teacher, but 94 can be like. And she said, now I can die in peace. She was, I said, you're very healthy. Said, oh, I, I know. And three weeks later, she died in her sleep. This painting has been used in uh, Russia and the Tsar time, in a train station where people come on the car and get healed. There's a minister here who I had befriended and got in trouble because of sexual activity. And I referred him to a therapist. But one Sunday, the therapist is out, and it was August, where my therapist leave town, and he asked for help. So he came over here, and he was really depressed and almost suicidal. I spent two hours with him, Alan, and he was even worse when it was about time for him to leave. And all of a sudden, I got that message from God, really. He said, Ask him if he can stay another 10 minutes. So I did. He said, Yeah. So I took him upstairs and then sat on the stairs, looked back at the painting of Jesus there. And a miracle took place. This guy's whole physical structure, his emotional and spiritual structure shifted. The guilt and the blame all disappeared. And he was healed. Amazing experience. He's no longer in the church, he's doing other things now, but his soul was healed. So, um, Diane asked this woman for, she said, well, what should we do with all of them? He said, you'll know when you're supposed to give it away to someone else. But right now, it needs to be with you, as it occurred to you. So uh, when she had mentioned that on the phone that it was a painting of Jesus Christ, then I said, well, okay, this is my message from November that God was giving me. Hey. So the first thing I see in the morning is, is this uh, painting. Yeah. It's a rather feminine painting more of a feminine energy, uh, but it, uh, reminds me what we're here to do, and that is to see people through love and forgiveness and see people's light instead of their shadow. Mm. Uh, uh, do you have a feeling for what experiences or forces in your life brought you to the point of seeking? I think everything I've done in my life, every, all the experiences that I thought I hated in growing up, problems I've had with my mom, my dad, my dyslexia, uh, were all important things for me to have. I wouldn't give them up for anything. Um, my writing style is um, different than most. It's uh, Most of my books have a lot of white space in them. Uh, I like s smaller books, not bigger books, because I'm dyslexic. Uh, I remember on Love is the Answer, uh, Diane and I were writing this, and I said, you know, Diane, I like my mechanic, who maybe he's not read a book since he left high school, to be able to read that and get something up. But I also like the professor of English or professor at a college where he'd be able to get it. And about four months after the book was out, my old Honda got in trouble and I 
took it in, and the service manager was calling me, telling me what was wrong with it. And I said, can you be a little more simpler than that? I'm, I'm dyslexic. It's hard for me to understand what you're saying. Oh, that's right. You're the author, aren't you? You know, your mechanic told me that he's read all of your books. I said, oh, thank you, God. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, God. Um, so I, I think uh, that there are no accidents in life. That uh, I know this is an interview, but I know that that's excuse for us to be together. The real reason is for us to have experience with, with, with each other. And what happens to this interview and your other things are really secondary, not primary. And uh, that there's no accidents. Everything that happens that there's a... For me, another way of getting closer to God, getting, letting go of the uh, parts of the onions, onions that keeps me in my ego. Mm. So, and my relationship with my ex-wife is great now. And that's a miracle because I never thought that would get healed. I'm sure she didn't either. Uh, my relationship with my two adult sons, which I never thought would get healed, uh, is, uh, I'm sure if you talk to them, they'd say I'm, I'm their, best, their best friend. And I'm just very blessed. Mm. All things that have happened to me that I never thought would happen. And I guess that answers my next question, which was, um, how has it affected your life to follow guidance? Well, uh, it's given me a peace that I never thought I could have. It's allowed my heart to expand to be able to embrace a lot of diversity. Uh, it's allowed me to meet people I never thought I would meet. You know, we did a special with the Dalai Lama on Children Teachers of Peace. Uh, we met with Mother Teresa maybe 14, 15 times. We used to do some work with missionaries at charity. We had some guidance just recently to be helpful to the people in the Kingdom of Tonga. And all of a sudden, six months later, we're there in the Kingdom of Tonga working with people and they're starting a center of attitude healing there. And there would be no reason for us to meet with the king, but we did. You know, and I think we were helpful to him that day. And that uh, before we left, we asked him if we could pray with him, which we did. And uh, people told me later on, you know, you don't hold the king's hand. And no one told me you don't come with the king's hand. So we were, we were in a circle holding hands with each other praying. And um, I think that's what God wanted. Mm. Um, can you talk a little bit about the obstacles on the journey? Oh, there are obstacles um, all the time. Um, 1979. A number of people were saying that uh, the success of the um, Center for Attitude and Healing had something to do with my personality and my charisma. And I knew that wasn't the case. And I really felt God was telling me, okay, this is the time for you to resign, not to be the director. And that was an obstacle because letting go of control meant some things were happening that wouldn't be the way I'd have done it. And there are a number of occasions where things came so difficult that looked like the baby I helped create might die. I remember one time they were having some severe financial difficulties. And my guidance has been very clear that we don't charge people for direct services. And the staff and the board were saying, hey, we have to do this now because you know, we're going to go out of business. I said, well, I, I don't have any control anymore, so if this is your guidance, you need to do that. But I need to let you know that if you do this or that, I, I, my guidance will be to divorce myself from the center and ask God to tell me what else I'm supposed to do, but I will not be part of that because I know that's not what I'm supposed to do. I know I'm supposed to be here, not ch charging for my time, and I know we're not supposed to charge and uh, the center didn't die. Now there are over 150 centers or groups around the world in uh, many different countries. And uh, 
and although it has its challenges from time to time, uh, things continue to to happen. There, there's a, another. Ch I remember a challenge there. early in the game. There, there's a book uh, called uh, "There's a Rainbow Behind Every Dark Cloud." Uh, if we could take a pause one moment, Father. Father. go off after five. There's a book, There's a Rainbow Beyond Every Dark Cloud that the children wrote and I helped, helped them do that, to share their story. And uh, I was trying to get someone to publish it, no one to publish it. And uh, said, you need to have this published even if it means you have to pay for it yourself. So I kept saying, well, I don't have the money, so I'm going to have to go out <laughs> here. And uh, finally we couldn't get a publisher, so we got someone to print it, but then who's going to pay for the printing? And all of a sudden I get a call, the books have come and the bills come. And so I asked, well, has God forsaken me? <laughs> what happened? Well, what I didn't know was there was a guy from the Boffin Foundation for Children. He had come about four weeks previous, and I took him through the center and it was about funding, and he didn't seem that interested. He wasn't that excited, you know. You're going through kind of a you couldn't really read his feelings. And that afternoon, the, those days we get two mail services, and a check for the exact amount came in from the Boffin Foundation that he thought what work we're doing was fine, and this was great. So. Things like that continue to to happen in ways. Uh, there was a uh, an obstacle. Um, I started a uh, lifeline for children and adults around Canada and the United States to help each other. We didn't have a center. And our board president wrote up a grant for the San Francisco Foundation to, for a thirty thousand dollar grant to help the money for this. And they called me and asked me who wrote the grant. I said, well, our, our, I guess our board president did. Well, he did it all wrong, and um, why don't you come in here with him? So I came here with him, and after about 10 minutes, this woman asked me, uh, Jan Polsky, how do you get your money in your center anyway? And I know the board president didn't like the word God. I didn't know whether to fudge or say the truth. And I finally said, well, to be directly, we really trust in God. I thought I saw a light go on in her, in her. She kept talking, and then about 20 minutes later, she came back, you know, you shouldn't be here asking for $30,000. I said, oh, Jerry, you shouldn't have said that word, God. I said, I'm going to recommend that you get $300,000. Not only that, she helped write up the grant, and uh, it was the biggest grant that uh, had been uh, given at, at that uh, time. It was the Buck Foundation had been under them, and this was one of the first grants that they, so the timing was just, and of course, our board president was absolutely right, doing what he did. And also, she was right, bringing me both there. Uh, but it's one of those, one of those miracles that uh, that happened. And of course, that presented another obstacle, because up to that point, everyone was a volunteer. So all of a sudden, some people are going to have to be paid, and some people aren't. And all of a sudden, you're dealing with money and other kind kinds of things. That was a problem for me because there's. Another part of me that felt that um, everyone should be a volunteer, <laughs> and that there shouldn't be that this kind of hierarchy kind of thing. It so happens that um, in most centers, everyone is a volunteer. In those centers around the world, this being the mother center, doing a lot of original kinds of stuff. They are doing things that we're doing. Actually, we did a working with the legislature in Hawaii. Can you imagine doing a a workshop for the state for the state legislature in California, for the House and the Senate, and over half the people showing up, uh, doing a support group for, for them. So uh, we've been doing a lot of work in the uh, different departments of the state there, Department of Health, Department of Social Welfare, prisons. So I think my work is really based on making live a little child should lead them, and uh, helping people see the innocent child in another person 
is really themselves. And regardless of the negative behavior that to see a Mother Teresa inside that person, or mm. another Seder, a Mandel in, inside that person. So um, to, to know that the light is what it's all about, not, not the lampshade. And do you find um, sometimes it hard to listen to your voice? You, could, you talked about sure, sometimes sure, the rational. Sure, you know, I think, um, I think uh, when I'm in a lot of physical pain, it's more difficult to listen to that, to embrace the pain rather than fight it. Um, When I put too many things on my plate, and part of that is my work in learning to simplify and have more balance in our lives, that's why you listen and to stay as much time in nature uh, as you can. And sometimes our schedule gets to overly committed. Maybe, maybe we didn't hear the right voice. Maybe we need to say no to more things. It's always difficult for me to say no. Could you talk a little bit about the way you ask for guidance? Is there certain prayers you say, certain meditations you do, certain tools that you use? I do my, I think what meditation is about is to empty your mind of thoughts. I visualize a garbage disposal in my mind, taking all my junk thoughts away. So there's only loving thoughts of God that I can listen to. Um, I suppose the most important thing I can say, if there's some shift that has taken place in the last five years, with many of them, what I consider miraculous experiences I've been privileged to, is that I used to be sort of committed. And I know I'm totally committed now, and I think that's a, that's a big difference. That uh, I want to make listening to God and being a vehicle of love and forgiveness is as important as breathing. And I like to breathe, so mm-hmm. uh, that's helpful to me in really trying to not deal with life on a, on a rational basis. I, I know that I have to make airline reservations about the future, but I don't have to get caught in preservation. Is it plane going to stop in time, or am I going to get there in time to do the lecture, or whatever that might be? I, but once I make that, I can come back and do my best to stay in the present. To let go ahead and experience in my old Honda driving over a bump and the rearview mirror fell to the ground, broke. So I knew this had to be a special message from God, a special delivery. <laughs> so I went over the side of the road just to give myself some time to say, okay, what's this all about? And I just started laughing and laughing and laughing because what I heard was, Jerry, When are you ever going to stop looking backwards in your life? And that was really helpful. I think it's when we're caught in our victimhood, we're caught in our judgments and our grievances of the past that we superimpose the past on the present and God's nowhere to be found when you're dealing with the past and the future. So I do my best to say this, this is my only present right now. I have to pay a little attention to the past, but by and large, it's pretty much here in the present. And then the present and the future become the same. Whereas my parents taught me, well, the past is going to be like the future, and the future is, uh, yesterday was awful, today's horrendous, tomorrow's going to be worse. Well, I believed that for a long time. The half bottle of water was half empty, now I believe it's really half full. So I'm very optimistic about the future. And uh, I guess the most important thing is I deal with life and death differently because when I started this work, I was killing myself with alcohol and yet I was afraid of dying. And I think young children have been wise spirits and young bodies teaching me and other people another way of looking at life. 
doesn't look like a death. I do believe what we're doing is called spiritual, practical spirituality. It's not religious, not from an organized religious kind of thing with a lot of rules and stuff like that. It just helps people see there were choices we can make that it's only our own thoughts that hurt us and that we can really do something about that. Mm. And that when you're in consciousness of giving, somehow, well, if I get depressed or upset, I'll go to the center and I'll go to a group meeting. I'll come out all, well, because I'm in the consciousness of giving again. I don't think there are any neat prescriptions to your question, you know, really. A combination of many small, small things that are very important. Are you, are you specific in prayers from the Course? Or? I do some specific prayers. I think I mentioned a few of those to, to, to you. But at this point, is it more just an intuitive process for you? Is that well. I write a lot of prayers myself, <laughs> and, and I practice those prayers. Uh, I put, I put in, there's some in the, Out of Darkness into the Light, but there are a lot of new prayers that I put in this book uh, called um, Good, uh, the, the Shortcuts to God uh, has a, a number of, uh, not only prayers, but just self-reflections. and. Uh, When I'm suffering from the dark night of the soul and the kind of insanity that you feel, and the anger, putting some of those things so people can identify with that versus the other aspect and the sense of light and wonderment and beauty when you're really feeling at one with God. Let me take a moment to make sure I've asked all my questions. I guess my last one is, um, is there any other thoughts and feelings you would like to share on the process of seeking, receiving, and following the divine guidance? We repeat that again. And the, the question is what? Um, do you have any other thoughts or feelings that you'd like to share about the pre uh, um, process of, of seeking guidance? guidance? To understand that what we tend to call common sense is not spiritual sense. And we live in a world that says, well, use your common sense, which is based on the past and experiences on the past, which usually based on fear and our judgments and other kinds of things, that some things are unforgivable. And I think when we're using our spiritual sense, it, it's really letting go of all your old models, uh, letting go of wanting to uh, win a popularity contest. I think if Jesus were alive today, he would not win a popularity contest here. And uh, to know that uh, that's okay. I'm not here to win a popularity contest. I'm here to follow, follow guidance. It was difficult at first uh, when a lot of my medical colleagues uh, Feel I must have been in some kind of accident talking about God and love when I should be giving pills out or doing other things. But miracles did happen there too, and uh, the AMA, AMA came out a few years after we started and wrote a very positive article. And many physicians now come come to our place, and they're added to the healing centers and medical schools now, and and uh, we're accepted in a, in a different way than we were 25 years ago when we were kind of thought to be kind of flaky or soft or not really know what we're doing. So, uh, and I think that comes from not wanting to change people. You know, to, have, to love people doesn't mean you're there to change people. Mm. And uh, it's hard to hear that inner voice of guidance if you think you're here to change or to act in a reactive kind, kind, kind of way. And uh, when you really know that we're more than just these bodies and that to... Uh, that when we are vehicles of God's love, that we are really uh, doing our best to 
heal the illusion that we're separate from each other and from God, and still accepting those that might not agree, not being evangelists, trying to make people believe that. But when you're demonstrating that yourself, that uh, then you're listening. And I guess the best litmus paper is what you're feeling inside. And are you are you feeling joyful? And I think. Uh, that lady in uh, Switzerland, when uh, Diane asked her, well, what, what's your biggest thing? She said, well, I let go of all my judgments. And if you look around you, Ellen, uh, people may not say they're using guidance, but uh, the real happiest people you know are, are those people who are not making judgments mm-hmm. and are living life in a, in a kindly, loving way and walking lightly. And whether they use the word guidance or not may be not the point. Uh, there are many very godly people who don't believe, believe think they believe in God. Mm-hmm. So I guess it's to question our decision making based on the past, which is based on fear rather than love. I guess that's the most important thing I could say as an ending.